Hello and thank you for joining us. I'm Bill Harris and this is Life Questions, a program that addresses your questions about life from a biblical perspective. I want to thank you for your thoughtful questions about life that we have received. And a local panel of ministers has been reviewing them and praying over them uh, for the answers to those questions. And they have joined us today for some insightful discussion. And these pastors include um, Reverend Chris Browning of Shawnee Alliance Church, Pastor Paul Ross of One Church in Lima, Pastor Craig Frack of Salina First Church of God. And rounding off our panel today is Reverend Dennis Gartner of New Knoxville United Methodist Church. We're grateful to all of you for, be all of you for being here today. Excited to be here. All right. Now, one of the questions that we got in, a good, a good, I think a good lead question we'll start with here. Um, this is a viewer that says, my sister-in-law says she is an atheist, but she is familiar with the Bible. She asked me why Jesus would allow the thief on the cross into heaven. In her opinion, it doesn't seem fair for someone to live a terrible life and then at the last minute repent and go to heaven. Do you have advice on how I can explain that to her? So what would, what would be your advice? Who wants to start off on that? I, th I think for me, it starts with, you know, especially if we're going to look at the scriptures, there's a parable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, hiring workers to work a field in different times of the day. And then the one who owns the field says, okay, I'm going to pay you all the same amount. And same thing. Well, that's not fair. Some of us work the whole day. We suffer through the worst parts of the sun. And, mm -hmm. you know, that was horrible. Why aren't we getting paid more? And if essentially, you know, in the end of the parable, Jesus says, well, it's mine to do with what I want. Yeah. So, you know, I'll say I have a very vested interest in, in the kindness of Jesus here. My mother accepted Christ three days before she died of colon cancer. Is that I'm, right? Yeah, I'm really appreciative wow. that Jesus' grace was so big. It's not just for me yeah. that figured it out yeah. 16, 17 years into my life, but it was for her Amen. that figured it out 50 plus years into her life. And, so, um, and, and part of that is to, who, who, who gets to decide the terms? Yeah. And you say that with love, but yes. are we going to recreate God in our own image? And if not, can the scriptures point us to his truth? And I think that's a good place to start there. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, I think she wrote, um, it doesn't seem fair. And I would say it's not. Right. <laughs> and thanks be to God, it's not fair. <laughs> yeah. You know, thank, th like that is, she's, she's uh, like Jesus would say sometimes, you're closer to the truth than you realize. Mm -hmm. That is much closer to the truth than she realizes that thanks be to God, it's not fair. That's the scandal of grace mm -hmm. that it isn't, if it was all, all things were fair, the thief and myself would both go to hell, uh, would both be destined to be apart from God, but it is not fair. And thanks be to God, it's not fair. We don't want fair. We think we want fair, but we desperately don't. <laughs> and I think too of the uh, times in the Gospels when God's grace is presented as so radical that it's surprising to humans. Yeah. Uh, you have, for instance, the uh, lost sheep where the shepherd has 99 in safety but goes looking for just the one. Mm -hmm. That's God's mm -hmm. grace mm -hmm. that seems uh, not sensible to a person who is counting, you know, profit and loss. Yeah. Uh, and the same with the prodigal son in that same chapter. The father could have said, well, I've got one faithful son anyway, and just forgotten about the younger one. That's not the way God's grace works. Amen. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You know, for me, it's that salvation is a gift. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter what we do, we cannot pay for that salvation. And because it's a gift, it is the responsibility of the gifter to give whomever he will. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the fact that the thief got into got salvation at the last minute is still something that shows and demonstrate the love of God, the agape love of God. That's unconditional. But you know, whenever I've had this question before about people who die suddenly, and and my thing is this: the Scripture tells us today is the day of salvation. None of us can predict when that time runs out. Yeah. And so, what we need to do is pursue God. So, when, what God is looking at. And what he sees and what he understands is goes beyond our comprehension. And so the thief on the cross, nobody knows where his heart was, but the master understood. Oh, yeah. And in that moment, he offered the gift. And so question answered, I don't think any of us could determine 
what was really the reason other than to say it was God presenting a gift to that man. Yeah. And I think it, it, what you're speaking of, the picture you're painting is in such stark contrast to religion where it's play by the rules, you know, play by the rule book. And like you said, it's not fair. It's not, it's not playing by the rule book. And it shows the mercy of God. And it demonstrates, I think, even today to the man out there on the street or wherever he is, wherever that woman is, that they can be saved no matter what their background is. They can have a, a police rap as long as they're armed, but they can be saved, can't they? Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's funny you say that because that is, ex is exactly what the God of this world does to try and laden us down with condemnation and judgment. Mm -hmm. I mean, we look at Paul himself and, and Paul the Apostle, I mean, coming out from his background, mm -hmm. I mean, most of the Christians would have run from him and said, no, even after he's a believer, yeah. you are not worthy. Yeah. <laughs> and and Ananias but he was. did try to get away yeah, from him. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah. he demonstrated that same gift, that same transition of yeah. God impartation. Well, and remember the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 1.15, here's a trustworthy saying, worthy of full acceptance, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, yeah. of whom I am the worst. Yes. He called yes. himself the worst. Yes, so that means that anyone other than the Apostle Paul is not the worst, and therefore um, we can understand that grace that God bestows upon yeah. us. I've been doing a little research on Paul about this very subject I'm going to be preaching here tomorrow when I'm taping my shows. That's, it's, it's going to be about Paul, one of the sermons is, that, that very thing. It's, it's striking, uh, the mercy of God. And I dare say we wouldn't be around this table if it was not for that mercy, gentlemen. Am I right? Amen. <laughs> you know, we, Amen. we wouldn't yeah. be here. Yeah. All right, well, let's go to another question here that a viewer wrote. Um, what are the best ways I can be a missionary in my workplace? I'm not really in a position to preach to my co-workers, but I still want to be a witness. What, what advice have you got for me? I loved this question because I think as pastors, we kind of are, uh, our cards are on the table, so to speak. They, people <laughs> expect us. That's why they avoid us, you know, on airplanes and put in their headphones like after they ask what you do for a living. Yeah. Um, but the, the one question I'd have for this, and only this person knows, when they say, I'm not really in a position to preach, well, maybe they're not in a position to give a sermon, but they're in a position to give a witness and a testimony and to share God's word. I would challenge any Christian who says, well, my workplace, I can't, I can't share my faith, I can't. I'm not saying that you have to hand out tracts to everyone you meet, and you don't, but when you're sitting around the lunch table, you know, eating your sandwiches, and someone asks, you can still have an answer for the hope that is with inside, mm -hmm. um, as it says in First Peter. You can still give a testimony to what God is doing in your life. You can still listen to your coworkers whose lives are struggling with addiction or failing marriages mm -hmm. or these things, and you can give hope in the name of Christ. And so I think sometimes they, they maybe look at pastoral ministry mm -hmm. and they look at a pastor getting up and standing at a podium and, and giving a well-researched and thought-out sermon. That's wonderful. But they can, they can preach. It just might look a little differently. And I, and I want to even push back on the idea that says, well, preach the gospel, always use words when necessary. The gospel <laughs> is words. Yeah. It says, blessed are the one who brings the words. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just about being the kind person, but it's about being the kind person and then giving credit and glory yeah. to Jesus yeah. along the way. Yeah. Well, for the most part, before we're going to be able to preach to someone, we need someone in the workplace, in the marketplace, in the schools, in the, in the, the civil areas having these conversations. And so, and so as simple as, you know, hey, that sounds pretty rough. How can I pray for you? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And if you are really are in a workplace where the offer to pray for someone is, is that taboo, that forbidden, um, I like causing problems, so do it anyway. But, mm -hmm. you, you know, um, but to be able to offer that, to be able to say to, to a waitress, mm -hmm. right? Hey, in a moment, I'm going to pray for my meal. Can I pray for you? You know, to be able to be that witness. And yeah, people don't want a sermon unless they're in Sure. Like, I've never been out. I've never been out hanging out with people saying, man, I wish someone was preaching at me right now. Mm -hmm. Right. But to be able to have compassion, to, be able to have kindness, to be able to take that little pocket of thy kingdom come yeah. with you as you go. That's that is missions. That is evangelism. Yeah. You know, I, I recall my first year in the military, in the Air Force, uh, the work environment was somewhat toxic 
because all of the guys were unbelievers. And I remember every day, every Monday, especially going into work and hearing the stories of the weekend escapades. And, and they come to me, Paul, well, how was your weekend? Great, I was at church. <laughs> I left it there, I lived the life. And you know, there was a moment within me where I felt somewhat, I can't do this anymore. And then one day, at the end of the day, as I'm walking out the door, one of the guys came over, he says, hey Ross, you got a minute? I said, sure. Pulled me to the side, reached in his jacket, pulled out a New Testament and he says, hey, I was talking to this girl and she told me, she's not talking to me unless I start reading this. Could you, I know you're a Christian, but could you help me understand this? Just like that introduction. And I thought about that. If I was in the light, you know, Matthew 5 says, ye are the light yes, yes. in a dark world. If the light is hidden, then how would the world see it? And so in that moment, I had a revelation that, man, it's not just me hitting them across the head of the Bible. It's me being the light yes. in mm -hmm. a dark place. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, ah, that's very good stuff. Very powerful. Yeah. Um, it's true. The gospel is words, so it has to be spoken. But as you were mentioning, the power is behind the example. Yeah. The power is behind the actions. Mm -hmm. Uh, the actions that precede the words, because in First Peter, um, the advice goes to wives who are married to unbelievers, and the advice is, submit yourselves to your own husbands, and, and uh, if you do that, that you may be able to win them over, not by using words, but by using your behavior. Yes, and uh, so there's power in the action that comes along with the words. It's funny you say that. I was counseling a, a, a couple in the same situation. One was a believer, the other. And you know what I told the husband? Because the wife was not a believer. And, you know, there was conflict there. And I said, you are the missionary to your home now. Yeah. Because God has given you the grace for that. Mm -hmm. And so once we understand that, it changes the, dy the, the, dyna the dynamics of <laughs> that relationship. It totally changes. It puts us in a place where... We're not seeing ourselves as burdened with this, but now as a missionary yeah. of light. Yeah, yeah, that's excellent. Well, listen, we've got more discussion to come. Uh, for instance, I'd like to talk about the effectiveness of youth programs in our church. We'll get to that and more in just a moment. Stay with us. We will be right back. Don't go away, there's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastors you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pastor suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. We're back. Thank you for staying with us. We appreciate that so much. And uh, we want to get into a question that we have here from a viewer uh, that relates to the youth ministries here. Uh, let's see. She says, it says some parents have chosen not to allow their teens to attend youth groups because they feel too many youth groups lack spiritual depth and are merely glorified social club opportunities that don't produce much spiritual fruit as the kids grow older. And it wants to know, do you have a response on this? Gentlemen, do you anybody have a response on this kind of thing? Yeah, <laughs> I do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I get a, a little frustrated because, uh, so first of all, you know, I'm, I'm a parent. Hey, there's this place where if your kid hangs out, he's going to be around other people who love Jesus and adults who love him and challenge him to grow in this faith. And uh, he might not memorize the entire Torah, mm -hmm. okay, but he's going to be around people who are positive. And sign me up, first of all, sign me up. Second of all, we have, we, we do not want to forsake the scriptures. We don't want to forsake the intentional process of discipleship, but we forget sometimes that a big part of discipleship is being together in community. And I'm telling you right now, you, you know, on the worst day of your life, yes, the scriptures, they need to be there. They need to be. And so do people who know you and love you and see through your ridiculousness and call <laughs> you on it and come alongside you. And, and so youth ministry, I think in a healthy church is supposed to supplement 
not replace the ministry of the church. If, if your kids are only going to youth ministry and they're getting everything they would throughout the body of the church, that, that church is really struggling because we should be, we, our children aren't the future of the church. They are the church, they're alive. Mm -hmm. So we should be incorporating them. They should be alongside us mm -hmm. as we worship. They should be, they should have grandfathers and fathers in the faith that don't share their DNA. They should be seeing and being encouraged, being prayed for by these folks in our churches who love Jesus desperately and to miss that opportunity, but to say, okay, well, you haven't memorized all the scripture or you haven't been able to answer all these theologies. Go read Grudem's systematic theology, right? Okay, yeah. But how about we come together with Christ in the center, we see him clearly, we grow in him, and when we graduate high school, we have a value in Christ-centered community and we seek it out. We seek it like, mm -hmm. I, 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 get, I, I respect the parent who says, well, I wanna prioritize my child's time, I challenge that. I challenge that very severely. We had a, we had a family who they, they grounded their kid and they grounded them from youth group. And, and, I, and I said, why would you, well, they, they don't need to go there, they're grounded. And I thought, and I, and I challenged them. I said, I, why would you ever keep them from the Lord? And I said, I get taking the cell phone, I get taking the video games or the car, you know, whatever punishment mm -hmm. they, they, you know, you do the crime, you do the time, like kind of thing. <laughs> but to keep them from coming to the youth group and they kind of get, well, they have fun there. Ooh. <laughs> praise God. Yeah. You know, praise God that they have fun there. Yeah. But they thought it as, well, it's kind of a reward. And I said, do you, do you really, would you ever want the Lord to keep you from the fellowship as a punit? Like, and so, but it was just this idea of like, well, they have fun there. And, and I thought, well, isn't that a great thing? And by the way, I, you know, cause we get this a lot, you know, well, if we're not, you know, it's not Bible drills and sword drills every single day at our youth group. Well, what are we really doing? Kids vote with their feet. Yeah. Adults That's like right. to vote in congregational meetings and have big long-winded board meetings. Kids vote with their feet and guess yeah. what they do? They don't come. Yeah. That's right. And so people look can, on the outside can look and say, well, that's a goofy game. And it's like that kid laughed with the other kid in school that he has nothing in common with, but that they go to the same church yeah. and now they're sharing community. Now they're laughing together. Now they just sang a song together. Now they're hearing a word together. And all under the auspice of God's grace and like you said, adults that love and care yeah. for them. And yeah, they played a goofy game along the way, <laughs> but you know what? Life is fun and life has joy and God gave us laughter. So praise God for mm -hmm. that. So I just really struggle when parents would say, well, I'm, I'm not gonna have my kid be a part of that. And I will say, if you look at your youth ministry and it's either not where you think it should be, then guess what? You can volunteer to help because <laughs> I guarantee you that pastor might say, we're not perfect. We could use more godly men and women. Mm -hmm. Come on in. The water's warm. <laughs> we would love to have you. And, and you. Go ahead. That's part of the problem because there, there are a whole segment of Christian parent now that are totally relying on the church yeah. to disciple their kids. And they forgot that ministry begins in the house. Amen. So you're saying well you're not discipling that what's going on in the house mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. i understand a parent wanting to, their kids to be in an environment where they're getting the word of god you know it says that evil communication corrupts good manners i understand that but just like pastor said here if you see a need this is a perfect opportunity for you to step up say how can i help how can i serve and that's a component that's really missing a lot of judgment but when it comes to stepping forward and being in service mm -hmm. unto God, that's an element that seems to be missing. We'll all give an account. I think we all mm -hmm. mentioned we have yeah. children. Yeah. We'll give an account, not for our youth, like we'll give an account for how we raised our kids. Mm -hmm. We have to disciple our children. Mm -hmm. That is a biblical command, that it is not your youth pastor's responsibility. And frankly, if you look at your youth pastor and think they're a little goofy, even more for you right. to disciple your children <laughs> and come alongside them so that then they have that balance and then they have their fun friend that they can go to youth group and that kind of thing. But it is mom and dad's responsibility yep. before yep. the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. to disciple their children. Now, I would, I would uh, just add two things. Number one, I do think this is a question that should challenge us as church leaders to remember that our youth programs need to include a, a, a very noticeable spiritual emphasis. Amen. We can stray away from the central core of our purpose if we're not careful. 
But the other point I would add, which one of you as a church leader knows of adults who never want to have fun at church? Mm -hmm. Are you telling me that just because you've grown up, uh, it doesn't matter to you anymore to be in a group where there's fun, mm -hmm. Christian fun that goes uh, on, mm -hmm. like in a Sunday school class party, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, or a, uh, some kind of a, a fellowship meal mm -hmm. that you have after church? I hear a lot of laughter. Sure. I hear jokes being told. <laughs> Adults enjoy the, the social part of Christianity sure. just the way young people do. Mm -hmm. and we're not mad, <laughs> but we're passionate because, because when the kids are going through depression and suicidal ideation, mm. right? When they're struggling with gender identity, when they're going through all these things and they don't have a community of faith because <laughs> because instead of creating a spot for them to see Jesus, to see how fun he is, to be able to experience him, and instead we made it a classroom environment that they are in constantly, that they are constantly struggling in, yeah. that they are over-tested, that they're over-pressured. When we as the church have emulated the school instead of yeah. calling the community around us toward a, a better standard, you know, we, we deal with this every day mm -hmm. and parents deal with it too. And usually by the time they're realizing that, oh no, there was tremendous spiritual fruit, right? We're, we're doing a lot of remedial ministry. We're doing a lot of, of, of counseling. We're doing a lot of heart work that could have been, and those years are lost. Mm -hmm. Those could have been some of the most fruitful ministry years. Though I'm not allowed to go into the school and start just sharing my faith, but my students are. Mm -hmm. They're allowed in every day. In fact, they're required to be there. They can share their faith in a way I never could. Mm -hmm. So I, I, would, I would really fight. And if it is just a social club, okay, I get that. I don't think that's the heart of the question. The question here is they're not getting the results I expect from a well-run you know, Christian education program. Mm -hmm. Good. Set, save up. Send them to a great Christian university. Have a minor in Bible. It'd be amazing. Then have them come serve in the church they grew up in and they love. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a nerve you struck when you talked about there is an attack on young people today. The suicide rate among young people yep. is up, you know? And uh, to me, there's a, there's a barometer there that's letting us know there's some deep-seated problems. What are we going to do to be effective at getting at these young people and to, to, to let them know, even if we don't say it in these words, but really that it's the devil behind that that's trying to convince you to take your life and, and, and shoot you out of this world into eternity, you know? How are we going to reach these young people that, that have come to an end of themselves? They feel that because of what they're experiencing in life, the only way out is suicide. One of the things I say to my daughter on a regular basis, um, I say, God has an amazing plan for your life, and I can't wait to see what it is. And the reason I do that is two things. One, I want her to let her know that I'm not God, that dad doesn't have an amazing plan for your life, you know, mm -hmm. that I'm moving the pieces on the chessboard because pastor's kid, and we know how that, that mm. God has an amazing plan for your life. And the reason I do that is because you're not here by accident. You're not just a speck of cosmic dust, that God has something big for your mm -hmm. life. And it is bigger than the drama and the meanness that you'll experience in school and the backbiting. And I'm just as excited uh, as she is to find out what God has for her, mm -hmm. but helping her understand that she has a bigger purpose and a bigger plan for her life. And she's 10 and I've been telling her that for five plus years. And if you asked my daughter, does God have a plan for your life? She would tell you, yeah, and my dad's really excited to see what it is. <laughs> so if you try and convince her your life is worthless, you should take it. My, my hope and prayer is that I've sowed enough seed that she would say, no, my life is powerful and God has an amazing plan for my life and that I, I, I'm going to do something. And I don't care whether that is mopping floors to the glory of Jesus or to being the president of the United States to the glory of Jesus, <laughs> that God will have an amazing plan for her life. But I don't know how often parents directly speak that truth mm -hmm. over their children on a regular basis. It's one sentence. But if I say it 750 times over the course of five years, they're going to start picking it up. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, and, and let's be honest, a lot of parents are going to bed and waking up and they're not processing that thought until it's, it's a problem. It's like marriages, healthy marriages. Outside the church, people don't go around saying, hey, have you been honoring your wife well recently? Mm -hmm. You know, that is a thing that, that we do a little bit different than mm -hmm. the culture around us. And it's a good thing. But, you know, to answer your question, we have to know them first. Yes. You know a great way yes. to know them? 
have something really fun where Jesus yeah. is there so they yes. come get to know him yeah. and then get to know, and get to disciple them. <laughs> That's right. Christian, you know? Christian friendships, Christian connections. Mm -hmm. How powerful are they? Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll move on to another question then. Let's I'll see. I'll calm down. <laughs> no, no, that's Did you report? This is curious. I'm curious about this. Uh, what is the purpose of people swaying during the music at church? I find it so distracting. Is there a reason this is happening? Am I just being negative? That's what the viewer wrote. Yes. Good. yes. <laughs> no, no, no. I just, I put an asterisk yeah. on it I, I a think, little bit. Uh, I, I, I think a lot of it's cultural. Yeah. Uh, I, I traveled to Honduras. Uh, we're part of some church plants down there, seeing God do some amazing things in San Pedro Sula this past October. I was just there. Their whole church worship service, they started with a dance team. Um, and every single praise and worship song, they had a whole dance team. Um, I, I, I can understand what the person said, because to be honest, I would say I wasn't distracted in a negative way, but I was like, man, there's a whole <laughs> d dance team. To them, I'd look around and my Honduran brothers and sisters, they didn't even, it's just the dance team. It's no yeah. different than the drummer or the bassist or the guitarist. It's a part of how they express their worship unto the Lord, which we see all throughout the scriptures. So a lot of it is cultural and go to any concert or watch any video, you're going to see people swaying because there's something I think God made in our souls That's intrinsically right. that right. we respond to music. Yes, you know, uh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think we've spent so much time defending and trying to tear these elements away. But the truth is there's no theological doctrine about swaying or dancing or, in fact, the Word of God tells us often in First and Second Samuel that the children of Israel danced before the mm -hmm, Lord. Mm -hmm. When the Ark of the Covenant was mm -hmm. returned, they danced. David yeah, danced. Yeah, David in danced. Psalms, he danced. Yeah. And I've asked this question, can you dance without moving? <laughs> if you're not moving, it's not dance. <laughs> then why is the scripture calling it dance? Yeah. Because it's expression, uh -huh. an expression. So I think sometimes we get caught up in the theology of this, and that's why Paul told the church in Titus. Mm -hmm. yeah. Listen, don't argue about those things. It profits nothing. Okay. All right. And on that note, we're going to have to leave it. It's a nice high note, and uh, we can leave your dancing, okay? There you go. There you go. Well, thank you very much for your sharing of your, uh, and all the input that you've given. And let me just say to the audience, uh, if you enjoyed this panel, just wait. They're going to be on again next week. <laughs> I set a new bar for them there for next go. week. So tune, again, tune in again next week, and uh, we'll be happy to minister to you all over again with some more questions from you, the viewers. Until then, I'm Bill Harris. Thank you for being with us today. Bye-bye for now. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at wtlw.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com.